I remember the day I saw the reptilian at the zoo very clearly. It was a sunny afternoon, and the sky was bright blue without a single cloud in sight. My family and I decided to visit the zoo because it was a perfect day for an outing. I was excited because I loved seeing animals, especially the reptiles. They always seemed so mysterious and different from other creatures. As we entered the zoo, the sounds of animals greeted us. I could hear the roaring of lions, the chirping of birds, and the chatter of excited visitors. The air was filled with the smell of popcorn and cotton candy from the food stands. We grabbed a map and started our journey through the winding paths of the zoo. We visited many animals that day. The elephants were magnificent with their large ears and long trunks. The monkeys swung from branch to branch, showing off their acrobatics. The flamingos stood gracefully on one leg, their pink feathers bright against the green grass. Each animal was unique and fascinating in its own way. After seeing many of the animals, we finally reached the reptile house. It was a large building with a sign that read, Reptiles and Amphibians. I felt a shiver of excitement as we walked inside. The air was cool and slightly damp, and the room was dimly lit to make the reptiles feel at home. The first thing I noticed was the large glass enclosures. Each one had a different habitat, carefully designed to mimic the natural environment of the reptiles inside. There were snakes coiled around branches, lizards basking under heat lamps, and turtles slowly making their way through water-filled tanks. I was in awe of the variety of reptiles on display. As we moved from one enclosure to another, I saw something that made me stop in my tracks. In one of the enclosures, there was a creature that looked unlike any reptile I had ever seen. It had the body of a lizard, but stood upright like a human. Its skin was green and scaly, shimmering under the light. Its eyes were large and almond-shaped, with vertical pupils that seemed to watch every move we made. I couldn't take my eyes off the creature. It was unlike any animal I had ever seen before. It moved gracefully, almost like it was floating. Its long, slender fingers ended in sharp claws that tapped lightly against the glass. I felt a strange mix of fascination and unease as I watched it. I read the sign next to the enclosure, but it didn't provide much information. It only said, Unknown Species. I wondered where this creature had come from and how it had ended up in the zoo. It seemed so out of place among the other reptiles. I stood there for a long time, watching the reptilian. It seemed to be watching me, too. I felt a connection like it was trying to tell me something. Its eyes were so expressive, almost human-like in their intensity. I imagined what it would be like to be in its world, to see things from its perspective. Eventually, my family called me to move on. Reluctantly, I left the reptilian behind, but it stayed in my mind for the rest of the day. Even as we visited the rest of the animals, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I wondered if anyone else had noticed how special it was. That night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about the reptilian and the way it had looked at me. I felt like I had witnessed something extraordinary, something that few people ever get to see. I wondered if the zookeepers knew more about it than they were letting on. Maybe it was a secret, something they didn't want the public to know about. The next morning I decided to do some research. I looked up information about reptilians and unknown species, but I couldn't find anything that matched what I had seen. It was as if the creature didn't exist. This only made me more curious. I wanted to learn everything I could about it. Over the next few weeks, I visited the zoo several more times. Each time I spent hours in the reptile house watching the reptilian. I took notes on its behavior, trying to understand more about it. I noticed that it was very intelligent, more so than any other reptile I had seen. It seemed to recognize me, reacting differently when I approached its enclosure. I started to wonder if the reptilian was trying to communicate with me. It often tapped its claws against the glass in a rhythmic pattern, almost like it was forming words. I tried to tap back, mimicking its patterns, but I wasn't sure if I was doing it right. One day, as I was watching the reptilian, a zookeeper approached me. He was an older man with a kind face and a gentle smile. 
He asked if I had any questions about the reptiles. I hesitated for a moment, then decided to ask him about the reptilian. To my surprise, he seemed genuinely interested in my observations. He explained that the reptilian had been found in a remote part of the world, in a place where no humans had ever been before. It was the only one of its kind they had ever seen. The zookeepers were still studying it, trying to learn more about its species and where it had come from. I felt a sense of wonder and excitement. I realized that I was part of something truly special. I continued to visit the reptilian regularly, and the zookeeper even allowed me to help with some of the observations. I learned more about the creature with each visit, and my fascination only grew. To this day, the reptilian remains a mystery, but I will never forget the first time I saw it and the feeling of connection I had. It was a reminder that the world is full of wonders waiting to be discovered, and sometimes the most extraordinary things can be found in the most unexpected places. In the town where I grew up, nestled in the shadow of the dense forest, legends were as thick as the fog that rolled in at dusk. The most enduring tale was of the Wolfman, a creature said to roam the woods under the light of the full moon. Though many dismissed it as mere folklore, I was always intrigued, a part of me wanting to believe that something so fantastical could exist just beyond the boundaries of our mundane lives. It was a crisp autumn evening when I decided to venture into the woods alone. The air was cool and sharp, the sky a deep indigo streaked with the first stars of night. As I made my way deeper into the forest, the towering pines seemed to close in around me, their gnarled branches twisting into grotesque shapes that cast long skeletal shadows. The only sounds were the crunching of leaves beneath my boots and the distant hoot of an owl, punctuated by the occasional snap of a twig somewhere in the dark. I had been walking for what felt like hours when I stumbled upon a clearing. In the center stood the remnants of an old abandoned cabin, its walls collapsing inward, swallowed by moss and creeping vines. The sight of it sent a chill down my spine, and I felt a strange compulsion to explore further. As I approached, a sudden movement caught my eye. I turned quickly, peering into the murky gloom beyond the tree line, but saw nothing. Just the wind, I told myself, though my heart began to race. The moon was high now, its pale light filtering through the canopy and casting an eerie glow on the scene. I turned my attention back to the cabin, stepping carefully over the threshold into what had once been the main room. Dust motes floated in the air, disturbed by my presence, and the floor creaked ominously beneath my weight. I scanned the room, my flashlight beam revealing little more than decayed furniture and scattered debris. Yet the feeling of being watched was unmistakable. As I moved to the back of the cabin, I heard it, a low, guttural growl that seemed to reverberate through the very air around me. I froze, the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. Slowly I turned to face the doorway, my flashlight trembling in my hand. There, just beyond the threshold, were two glowing eyes, reflecting the moonlight with an unnatural intensity. My breath caught in my throat as the creature stepped into view. It was massive, easily over seven feet tall, with a hulking, muscular frame covered in coarse, dark fur. Its face was a grotesque amalgamation of man and beast, with a snout-like nose, sharp, protruding teeth, and those piercing yellow eyes that seemed to burn with an inner fire. The Wolfman. The legend was real, and it was standing right in front of me. For a moment, we were both motionless, locked in a silent standoff. Then, with a sudden primal roar, the creature lunged. I stumbled backward, my flashlight clattering to the floor and plunging the room into darkness. I scrambled to my feet and bolted from the cabin, the sound of heavy, pounding footsteps close behind. Panic surged through me as I raced through the forest, branches whipping at my face and snagging my clothes. I could hear the wolfman gaining on me, its breath hot and ragged, a mix of growls and snarls that seemed to echo all around. My lungs burned, my legs screaming in protest, but I dared not slow down. I veered off the path, hoping to lose the creature in the dense underbrush, but the darkness was disorienting. I tripped over a root and went sprawling to the ground, the impact knocking the wind out of me. 
I cried out in pain, adrenaline the only thing keeping me conscious. It howled in fury, giving me just enough time to scramble to my feet and continue my desperate flight. I didn't know how long I ran or in which direction. All I knew was that I had to get away. Eventually the sounds of pursuit began to fade, though I couldn't be sure if it was real or just my mind playing tricks on me. I stumbled out of the forest and into the open fields, the first light of dawn breaking on the horizon. I collapsed to my knees, exhausted and bleeding, my body racked with sobs of relief and terror. When I finally made it back to town, I was a mess, dirty, bloodied, and barely coherent. I tried to tell people what had happened, but my story was met with skepticism and pitying looks. No one believed me. The legend of the Wolfman was just that, a legend. But I knew the truth. I had seen it, felt its claws, heard its savage growls. The scars on my back would serve as a permanent reminder of that night, a testament to the horrors that lurk just beyond the edges of our understanding. I never ventured into those woods again, and I warned others to do the same. Some listened, while others scoffed, convinced that the old stories were nothing more than figments of an overactive imagination. But as the moon rises high and the night grows still, I sometimes find myself staring out towards the forest, a shiver running down my spine. Because I know that somewhere out there, hidden in the shadows, the wolfman waits, watching, biding its time. And I pray that no one else will ever have to face the terror that I did, alone in the dark, with nothing but the whispering wind and the beast that stalks the night. The rain had finally ceased after what seemed like an eternity. It was one of those storms that made you question the strength of your own roof and the durability of the walls that surrounded you. For hours, the sky had been an unrelenting torrent of water, a curtain that separated the world into a cacophony of nature's fury and the silent, anxious waiting inside. As the last drops fell, I decided to venture out, drawn by the smell of the earth and the sight of the world reborn under a fresh coat of rain. The river that bordered our small village was now swollen and ferocious, its usual gentle murmur transformed into a wild roar. Trees and shrubs on its banks bent low, their branches laden with rainwater. As I walked closer, the air was thick with the scent of wet foliage and the distant sound of water rushing, merging into a symphony that felt both chaotic and oddly serene. I followed the path along the river, my boots squelching in the mud, eyes scanning the landscape for any changes brought by the storm. The water level had risen significantly, and I noticed small creatures, frogs, insects, even the occasional snake, displaced by the floodwaters, now seeking refuge on higher ground. It was as if the whole ecosystem had been upended, each living thing caught in a desperate scramble to adapt to the new reality. It was then that I saw it, a glimmer under the water, something that shimmered and moved in a way that was neither fish nor debris. I squinted, trying to make out the shape beneath the churning surface. As I stepped closer, the water seemed to pulse and breathe, the shimmer becoming clearer, more defined. My heart quickened, and I felt a mix of fear and curiosity grip me. The creature surfaced slowly, almost lazily, as if aware of my presence and unbothered by it. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, and yet in the recesses of my mind I knew what it was. The Mamlambo. The stories of this river-dwelling entity had been whispered in our village for generations. A half-serpent, half-horse creature that was as beautiful as it was deadly, a guardian and a predator. I had always dismissed the tales as mere folklore, a way for the elders to keep us children away from the river's edge. But here it was, in the flesh, or scales, before me. Its head was sleek, almost serpentine, with eyes that glowed an eerie green, catching the light even in the dim post-storm haze. The body was elongated and muscular, scales reflecting the wetness of its surroundings, a tapestry of greens and golds that seemed to ripple with the movement of the water. It was mesmerizing, a blend of grace and raw power, and I couldn't tear my eyes away. The Mamlambo floated closer to the surface, and I could see the delicate fin-like structures along its spine, undulating softly with the current. 
There was an intelligence in its eyes, a recognition that sent a shiver down my spine. It was as if the creature was assessing me, determining whether I was a threat, a curiosity, or perhaps something more. I felt a strange connection, an understanding that I was witnessing something ancient, something that belonged to a time long before humans had laid claim to the land. As I stood there, rooted to the spot, the Mamlambo began to circle, creating a gentle whirlpool in the water. The motion was hypnotic, drawing me into a trance-like state. The stories I had heard spoke of the Mamlambo's ability to lure its victims with its beauty and then drag them to the depths. But in that moment, I felt no fear, only a profound sense of awe and reverence. The creature's movements were fluid, almost dance-like, and I watched, entranced as it continued its display. It was then that I noticed the small objects caught in the whirlpool, shimmering stones, fragments of shells and bits of debris, all swirling around the Mamlambo in a chaotic dance. Each piece seemed to catch the light in a different way, creating a kaleidoscope of colors that mirrored the creature's own iridescence. I felt an urge to reach out, to touch the water, to connect with this enigmatic being. My hand hovered above the surface, the tips of my fingers brushing the cold, turbulent water. The Mamlambo paused, its eyes locking onto mine, and for a moment time seemed to stand still. There was a depth to its gaze, a silent communication that transcended words. I felt as if the creature was inviting me to join it, to experience its world, if only for a brief moment. As I lowered my hand into the water, the Mamlambo swam closer, its scales brushing against my skin. The sensation was electric, a jolt that traveled up my arm and into my very core. I could feel the power and the ancient wisdom of the creature, a connection that defied explanation. It was as if the Mamlambo was sharing its essence with me, allowing me a glimpse into the mysteries of its existence. Years ago, when I was 22, I experienced something unforgettable. I was driving back to my home in Connecticut from a visit to Vermont and had left later in the evening, just as the sun was setting. The drive was about three hours long, and my radio wasn't working, making me dread the quiet journey ahead. I had been driving for about 30 minutes when I saw a woman on the side of the road, narrowly missed by the car in front of me. An instinct urged me to stop and check if she needed help. I pulled over and approached her cautiously. I asked if she was all right and if she needed a ride. She nodded and got into the passenger seat. In a way, I was relieved to have company for the long drive to break the monotony. I glanced around before getting back into the car and driving off. We made small talk, and she began to open up. I noticed she had an accent, suggesting she wasn't from around the area. In the dim light, I hadn't paid attention to her clothes. They looked like something from another era, like an old-fashioned undergarment dress. I jokingly asked, Do you work at a place where you have to dress like it's the olden days? She gave me a puzzled look and turned her gaze back to the road. I shrugged it off, thinking she might just be tired or not in the mood for jokes. I pointed to my broken radio and apologized for the lack of music. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her mouthing something, and miraculously, the radio turned on. I gasped, Wow, you got it to work. She frowned and tilted her head, asking, This thing is a radio? I nodded, and she examined it like it was the first time she'd seen one. You've never seen a radio before? I asked. She shook her head and said, I've only heard music in church. Given her attire and her unfamiliarity with modern technology, I started to suspect she might be Amish. Well, you can use this dial to search for different stations, I explained. For some reason, all we got was static. Sorry about that. I guess it's still broken, I said. As we drove further, I noticed a light in the distance. As we approached, it became clearer. A man was standing in the middle of the road with a torch. I thought to myself, what is this guy doing? That's dangerous. I slowed down and stopped the car about 100 feet from him. I looked at the woman, and her face turned pale. It seemed clear that this was the person she was running from. I whispered to her that I would drive around him quickly, but it might get bumpy. She took a deep breath and sighed. 
No, it's okay. I need to face this, she said. She got out of the car and walked towards him. I rolled down the window just enough to hear them. Suddenly she shouted, I've done nothing wrong. You have no reason to accuse me of being a witch. She raised her arms, yelling with all her might. The man responded sternly, You have practiced witchcraft and witnesses have not denied it. You will be burned at the stake, witch. I slumped in my seat, wanting to drive away but unable to leave her. As I watched their exchange, I noticed a mob of men with torches approaching from behind my car. By the time I saw them, it was too late to drive off without running them over. So I ran to the woman's side. Confused by their exchange but certain of the danger, I took her hand, and we ran into the forest. We ran for what felt like ten minutes before ducking behind a sturdy tree. We caught our breath, listening for any signs of pursuit. She could tell by my expression that I sensed something was off. If I told you I was a witch, would you fear me? She asked. I paused, still catching my breath. You haven't shown me you're a threat, so no, I replied. If you're a witch, you're not from these times, are you? I asked. She grew quiet and nodded. I'm not living nor dead. Salem was once my home, but it was all taken from me, she said. She explained that she was a witch, but not evil. The man on the road was once her fiancé, but she refused to marry him. Out of spite, he spread false accusations of her practicing witchcraft. I could hear the pain in her voice as she continued. She told me the worst part was that she had a child with a man she truly loved and never knew what became of them. I expressed my sympathy and asked her name. She told me it was Elizabeth Stanton, and her lover's name was Jonathan Locklear. I chuckled. What a coincidence, my last name is Locklear. My smile faded as we locked eyes. She leaned in closer, examining my face. Yes, yes, of course, your features are distinct, she said, turning my chin. My descendant, she cried out happily before vanishing into thin air. I gasped, falling back, stunned by what I'd just witnessed. I made my way back to my car, still in the middle of the road. There was no sign of anyone, so I sat back in my seat. Trying to process everything, I turned the radio on. It caught a channel and started playing music. When I returned home a few hours later, I tried to search for Elizabeth and Jonathan's names, but found nothing. To this day, I haven't told anyone about this, but I believe Elizabeth really is my ancestor. It felt like we connected in those final moments, and I think she's at peace now. For the past 20 years, I've loved being a ranger. Now I'm preparing to retire because my dad needs help on his farm in Colorado as he's getting older. Listening to your channel these past few months has made me reflect on some interesting experiences I've had. My job has taken me all over the country. Years ago, I was working at Santa Rosa Lake State Park in New Mexico. My parents used to visit and camp there in the late fall when the farm wasn't as demanding. My dad enjoyed fishing for walleye in the lake. Despite the cold, the area was peaceful and quiet during that time of year. My mom, on the other hand, would get a bit bored. She really wanted to visit Carlsbad Caverns, about four hours south. Since I had a couple of days off and had never been there, we decided to make the trip together. We didn't leave until late afternoon because I had to handle a plumbing issue at the park. On our way, we stopped in Roswell for food, taking time to explore the alien novelty shops and snapping goofy pictures around town. We had dinner at a UFO-themed diner, which felt like a nostalgic road trip from my childhood. By the time we left Roswell, it was about nine o'clock. We still had about an hour and a half to drive to our hotel. If you've ever been to Arizona or New Mexico, you know about the endless desert roads. It felt like we were out there alone, with the road stretching out in the dark, barely any cars in sight. Around 10 o'clock, about an hour outside of Roswell, my dad pointed out something unusual in the sky. There were two incredibly bright lights, bigger than airplane lights, directly ahead of us. They weren't planes or helicopters, but seemed to be chasing each other in the sky, moving up, down, back and forth, and turning on a dime. They even stopped and reversed direction in an instant, like dragonflies. We were all mesmerized. Being near Roswell made it seem almost cliché. 
I pulled over and we watched in amazement, half expecting it to be some sort of joke. After a few minutes, we continued our journey. Then the second incident happened. Out of nowhere, our tire just popped. It wasn't just a blown tire. We heard a loud bang and saw sparks. The tire was shredded, scattered along 50 feet of the road. My dad, usually composed, looked visibly shaken. As we inspected the damage, lightning strikes suddenly appeared in the sky. Thunderclouds had formed, and the two bright lights were moving behind them, descending toward us. As they got closer, they cast a strange blue glow over everything. I seriously thought aliens were invading. Within minutes, the light swept past us and disappeared toward the north. The clouds vanished, revealing the usual stars. We changed the tire in record time and were relieved to reach our hotel. We searched for any news of strange weather or events but found nothing. We were just glad to have experienced it together. Carlsbad caverns were spectacular, with incredible formations and an unreal echo. The effort to make the park accessible was impressive, and we spent more time there than expected. I didn't get hired at Carlsbad, but I was glad to return to my familiar territory. That trip felt surreal, and my parents still get weirded out when we talk about it. It was absolutely wild.